Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Ted Gardner, and I'm an interviewer for the Oral History Project here at our public library, uh, part of the Library of Congress uh, great program of interviewing veterans. And uh, we have the honor and the pleasure of talking to Mr. Bill Harrison here today from Kenwood, Cincinnati. And uh, Bill, where were you born? I was born in Cincinnati. Right here, your 1933. Name. How about that? Yeah. How about that? And uh, where did you go to, uh, uh, well, elementary school? Well, elementary and high school was in Pittsburgh, PA. Oh, you were? My family moved to Pittsburgh uh, uh, in 33, shortly after I was born during the Depression. Oh, yes. So I grew up there, and I lived there until I was about 19 or 20. Oh, I see. Nice. <clears throat> uh, you have um, brothers and sisters? Or? One brother and two sisters are all deceased. Uh, I see. Oh, very. Well, the, um, <coughs> you, you, you still have, of course, a, a recollection of the Depression days. And yes, I do. <laughs> as I do, too. Yeah, those, those, were, those were interesting times, to say the least. And uh, now, when you went to Pittsburgh, um, uh, were you, um, uh, you went through school and high school there? I in went Pittsburgh? through high school in Pittsburgh, okay. yes. Okay, okay. Did you have uh, any particular hobbies or anything that you were interested in in school days? During school days, I, I played a lot of basketball and I got into golf. Oh, good. Uh, and I played some sandlot football, too. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, it's interesting, this uh, discussion that's going on now in the, in the NFL about uh, equipment and hitting people yeah. and so forth. <clears throat> but sandlot football was a lot of fun. It was, it was a lot of fun, but it was, <laughs> it, it was tough. <laughs> yes, it was tough. <laughs> We, we didn't have the equipment they have now, but... Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, but it was fun. Was your father in business uh, there uh, in Pittsburgh? Well, he, uh, yes, he was in uh, sales management. Oh, mm -hmm. very good, very good. Well, that, uh, that type of thing could be a, a nice background for his, for his son, you know, and you grew up uh, under that sort of influence. The, um, there are always times in a person's life when there are certain dates and certain events <coughs> that we remember. And you remember where you were on uh, the 7th of December, 1941? Absolutely. <laughs> I know I can remember it as vividly as I'm sitting here right, right. now. And uh, I, uh, I was... Uh, Eight years old mm -hmm. when uh, when we heard the broadcast over the radio, right, and uh, and then it all got started yes. from there. Yeah, you know, I'll never, never forget that day. Yeah. Yes, that that is a memorable day. Well, it uh, it certainly changed uh, a lot of people's lives and and uh, some for the some for the good and some for not. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, the <clears throat> the interesting thing about it is what it did for our for our country <clears throat> because we'd been in that depths of that depression and, and it was still going on you know clear up into oh, yeah, the sure in, was. into the 40s yeah and um, <clears throat> so it was a it was a, a very very tremendous influence on on many lives well now. So there you are, uh, you're, you're in Pittsburgh at the age of 19. Uh, you had a draft number? Oh yes, I had a draft number. <laughs> and but did I, they give you a call? <laughs> well, no, I didn't get drafted. I went to, uh, uh, I, in 1950, I entered Vanderbilt University. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, of course, registered with the Pittsburgh Draft Board because that was my permanent address. And uh, while I was at Vanderbilt, I became involved in Army ROTC. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
by the time I graduated, uh, of course, the Korean War was had uh, been well underway, and they were, I think, in uh, '54, they were at the uh, they were at the peace table in Panmunjom, and they had stopped fighting, but the Korean War was still in effect, right. uh, officially. Yeah. In any event, I got uh, a commission as a second lieutenant in the uh, Army Chemical Corps in 54. Mm. Went, in, went on active duty almost immediately that summer. My word. And uh, I uh, was at Fort McClellan for a number of months. I went to the Army Chemical Corps school there mm. for officers. Mm -hmm. And then I would, became a platoon leader in a in the 62nd Chemical Company, a smoke generator outfit. Smoke generator? Uh, they were used, smoke generator units were used to lay smoke screens oh, yeah. in, uh, in front areas. And uh, we were talking about the Rhine River before. Uh, they were used uh, to a great extent in the mm -hmm. crossings of the Rhine to obscure the enemy vision. Right. And uh, it was, they were used in Korea too, yeah. quite a bit. It was yeah. it was a combat outfit. Yeah. But anyway, uh, that that uh, then I was transferred to uh, Presidio of San Francisco. That was temporary duty, uh, uh, and then uh, I was there a short time. And then I was sent to uh, Camp Desert Rock, Nevada. Mm -hmm. That was more temporary duty, and that was during the atomic testing in 1955. Oh. Oh, for God's sake. That was, and I went there at, uh, at the end of March, 55. What was your, what was your uh, uh, activity there, your duty? Uh, as I was, a, I was a staff member uh, of Colonel Ludicky's uh, Sixth Army Chemical Group. Mm -hmm. And uh, the main, uh, uh, main mission we had was to, uh, to, to, to was radiological safety uh, for uh, uh, in connection with all the troops that were being rotated in and out of there for different sure. shots that were being conducted out at Yucca Flats and Frenchman's Flats. Oh, yes. We, uh, units would come in from different military installations and uh, we'd run them through and then run them back out so they could see what happens, <laughs> what, what it looks like before and what it looks like after. Right. And, and we were also doing a lot of research on uh, developing uh, radiation fallout. And we had were, you studied, uh, had you majored in chemistry at Vanderbilt? I, I took chemistry courses, but I was not a chemistry major. Oh, no. I see. No. But, uh, we, but we learned a great deal about radiological safety in the sure. chemical course school, because our mission was CBR. Chemical, biological, and radiological. Well, of course, that was so important in, <clears throat> in that period. Uh, uh, radiation and uh, danger from and fear of mm -hmm. and all oh, that yeah. sort of thing. We were still learning a lot then, too. It was, those were yeah. the early days. Sure. And uh, there were a lot of unknowns still yeah. about radiological safety. Well, you know, <laughs> speaking of Nevada, you, that. That must have been kind of a <laughs> kind of a culture shock for you. It was. <laughs> we were up in the mountains, and uh, it was barren. Yeah. Hot in the day, very cold at night. Right. And uh, we uh, we we saw the spectrum of uh, conditions up there. Uh, uh, typically, uh, a major shot, which would be scheduled, uh, would. Uh, encounter numerous postponements because the atmospheric conditions weren't favorable mm -hmm. and they were concerned about radiation fallout patterns affecting high population areas. Sure. So if the conditions weren't right, we'd be sit out there all night waiting for a shot to be uh, detonated on top of a tower. They were all tower shots then. Now this, this Describe the, what what kind of a what kind of an explosive was that? Atomic energy. That was These all were atomic atomic, energy. atomic devices. Wow! And uh, uh, a good many of them were quite larger than the ones used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Really? Oh yes. Yeah. yeah well, were. you bring up names like Frenchman's Flats and 
things like that that we haven't heard of for a long, long time. The only thing you hear about that these days is whether or not the uh, federal government will allow the uh, uh, radioactive waste to be uh, yes. stored there what in, in the mountain. Do? Yeah. And that's a big problem, isn't it? Where did it's a big issue, yeah. 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 Well, it's 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 a it's a sociological issue too because people don't want to, <coughs> things like that buried near the, where they live or anything like that. Nobody lives near there, though. Nobody lives there. <laughs> well, the nearest city was Las Vegas. Oh yeah. And that was way down in the valley, about 60 miles from from Camp Desert Rock, which was a I temporary see. temporary uh, right. post. Everybody there was uh, it was a temporary assignment. How large a unit was this that you were in, uh, personnel-wise? How many? Well, the uh, the staff unit was rather small, really, at, at Camp Desert Rock. Uh, I can't give you a number on mm -hmm. one, how many, but it was it was not a not a large number of personnel. Yeah, it doesn't uh... because it was very technical. We we were involved in a lot of. Uh, radiological safety experimentation in helicopters. Mm -hmm. After shots were detonated, mm -hmm. uh, we would fly over the forward area and plot ISO intensity lines and, mm -hmm. and radiation fallout patterns. Wow. But our, the number of people involved was not a great number, although right. the, right. The, uh, uh, down the road we had the Atomic Energy Commission people and uh, they had a lot of people there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, of course, we, many of us can remember the, uh, the days of the, <clears throat> of the big bikini test, you know, out in the Pacific. Yes. With the Navy and to see what uh, effect it would have on ships and things Those like were, that. That was an H-bomb test. That was an H-bomb. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Which was much greater and, and, uh, in magnitude than mm -hmm. the uh, uh, than the atomic devices that uh, were tested in Nevada, right. much larger. Right. Well, you must have had <laughs> you must have had <clears throat> some very interesting experiences with with uh, men you'd never met before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all things like that. Any. Uh, you always do. Humorous experiences come to mind that. Uh, well, I, I remember one of my good friends at, at Camp Desert Rock was a, uh, a, an Army Signal Corps pilot. And they had some light aircraft there. And uh, of course, they were, they were flying helicopters too. These were, I think they were referred to as Hueys. They were helicopters yeah. that were of sufficient uh, capability. They could carry a squad of men mm -hmm. uh, in and out of an area. And uh, my good friend uh, had the unique uh, record of two crash landings, uh, which he survived. Uh, they weren't his fault. He just happened to be, uh, it was equipment failure in both right. instances. But he, he survived two crash landings. And then another occasion, I remember that, uh, that he, was, uh, uh, he was coming back from a, an, a hard night in Las Vegas. <laughs> and uh, and the wee hours of the night, he he went to sleep and went off in the desert. His car rolled, and he ended up with his head buried in the sand. And fortunately, some of his friends were following behind, and they went out in the desert and dug him out of the sand so he didn't suffocate. <laughs> he was uh, a bad luck charm, to say the least. But he bit. He was a friend, and one night we went into Las Vegas after that. And sure enough, somebody sideswiped me, went through a red light, sideswiped me, and I thought, I thought, Grub, I'm never going anywhere with you again. You are a bad luck charm. Uh, but that was humorous, but uh, fortunately, no, nobody got hurt badly. Yeah, uh, that, that's right. You know, funny things happen. Well, you know, as, as you pointed out, living in, in an area like that, <clears throat> uh, the desert and the mountains and uh, Pretty barren and pretty uh, desolate. It was. It was. We were very close to Death Valley, and uh, 
one of our uh, one of our associates out there, one of the, uh, had been there a while, found a water hole out in the middle of uh, the desert in Death Valley. A small water hole. It was an underground river that came to the surface well, at one point. There are underground rivers out there, and, right. uh, but they're pretty deep. Yes. But this one developed a, a hole at the top, and uh, it, it was uh, it was a challenge to go in it because it had a temperature of 30 degrees Fahrenheit. But it wow. would but it wouldn't freeze because of the circulation in it. It was moving oh, so I fast see. that it Constantly. it wouldn't freeze. But it, we were all challenged to go out, out in Death Valley and uh, jump in that water hole and try to survive the 30 degree wow. temperature. Waters. That is really. I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend it. No. no. <laughs> but, but we all had to do it to show that we were manly. You know. Sure. Whatever. Well, besides uh, besides going to uh, Las Vegas at. Uh, on uh, on furlough or something. Uh, that was temporary did, duty. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, did you have um, uh, athletic uh, facilities where you were that you did? Uh, you played games and uh, did exercises and so forth. Not much in the desert. No, <coughs> we really didn't. Uh, and I finished my TDY at in the in Nevada. Then I was. Uh, then I was sent to my permanent uh, unit assignment at Fort Ord, California. Oh, at Fort Ord. So I spent the, the last year and a half mm -hmm. on my active duty at Fort Ord in a small troop unit. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a 50th chemical platoon. Okay. Uh, it was a small TO and E uh, troop unit. Now, Fort Ord is in Northern California, isn't it? It's uh, Monterey. Monterey. Yeah, it's closed now. They closed it several years ago, but it, at that time it was the home of the 5th Infantry Division, so it was a big post. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were we were support troops mm -hmm. in the Chemical Corps. Um, did you ever have any uh, expectations to be shipped overseas, or we didn't uh, we didn't know uh, whether we would possibly go or not because uh, we knew that if, if the hostilities hadn't ended or if they had uh, if they started up again for whatever reason uh, that there was a possibility that's that's as much as we knew right, right. we didn't know anything more definite than mm -hmm. that so things stayed status quo and the, the peace talks continued and uh, there was a ceasefire and uh, that was the end of uh, end of the fighting right. <coughs> I think that was in 50, around 54, mm -hmm. and I think the, uh, I'm not sure when they officially declared the uh, Korean War ended, I think it might have been 55, sometime in 55, mm -hmm. but by that time uh, uh, I was still at Fort Ord. But the, the one thing about the Korean conflict, though, be having been in that, during that period, I was eligible for the Korean GI Bill, uh, as everybody was, sure. and uh, I uh, used that to my advantage to go to law school after I got finished well, active duty in the army. Yeah, so I did, I did uh, take advantage of that. Well, that's that's. And it was uh, it was uh, uh, paid most of my tuition for sure. three years. So that was a remarkable thing, you know, that, that GI Bill. It just it just. Uh, solidified or strengthened our nation so much by giving the opportunity of mm -hmm. higher education to personnel that probably never would have done it on their own if mm -hmm. there hadn't been something like that. Especially after your war, World War II. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah. That, yeah that, that, was that was a significant uh, thing. That was a, a very, very, uh, a very important part of our lives. Well, the um, um, how, how did you feel about the politics at, at that time? There was so much conflict, not declaring it a war and this and that and so forth and so on. <clears throat> how did you fellows feel about it? Well, my feeling was that uh, if, it's, if, if it looks like a war, it's a war. <laughs> right. And the politicians didn't see it that way. They saw it as a uh, UN 
uh, conflict. Right. Uh, but uh, I didn't get involved in that very much. But but I thought it's a war. Oh, absolutely. And it should be called a war. Absolutely. When when you lose when over fifty thousand men die, it's a war. Yes. It's a hell of a big war. Terrible. Terrible. Not to mention all the men that were wounded too, which oh, was a much greater stay. number than that. I should stay and 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 we're still we're still fighting it in a way with the, what do we have on the ground over there? We have 200,000 troops uh, on the uh, 39th <clears throat> parallel. Yeah, the 38th parallel 38th. is still, still the demarcation line as it was established in 1950, 53 or 54. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're right, we do have many troops there. Gosh, I know. And that's been going on now for what, going on 60 years. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's. You'd think that we'd be able to work something out like that, but those uh, <laughs> those North Koreans seem to be pretty entrenched. And well, the um, uh, where did you go to uh, law school? I went to the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia. Mm, nice. Yeah, I was fortunate to go Beautiful there. Beautiful place. Very fortunate. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I should say. Well, you were surrounded with history there. I certainly was. Yeah. <laughs> wow. that's, that's Jefferson country. Yeah, as I should say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, one of my great heroes in history. Oh, absolutely. Even before that, but uh, <laughs> when you spend time around Charlottesville, uh, it, it's almost as though his spirit is ever present. Yes. That's yeah. how that's how strong it is. Yes, the architecture and everything that, that uh, he did. Uh, he did designing things. And well, his his proudest uh, accomplishment <clears throat> was establishment of the University of Virginia. Yes, which he uh, he designed, built, laid out, and hmm. and uh, cajoled the politicians to provide the funding so mm -hmm. he could build it, and he watched the construction of it. Uh, from his mountaintop home in Monticello yes. uh, through a telescope. How about that? Uh, fantastic uh, career. Yes. Uh, we've seen few men like that ever in our history. Well, that's, uh, that's true, and uh, boy, do we need them. <clears throat> so we need them now, but uh, I don't know where they are. <laughs> we need statesmen. Yes. Where are the statesmen? I should say, well, you're speaking of Monticello. Uh, uh, that that is such a gorgeous place. Such a, as you say, you feel the spirit of the man. And uh, the um, um, going back a little bit, um, you got your bachelor's degree at Vanderbilt, right? Then and I, then I was commissioned and went on. Went on duty, active duty, mm -hmm. and after active duty, went to the University of Virginia Law School. Right. When I came out, I was a first lieutenant in uh, '56, uh, and uh, I didn't stay active in the reserve. Okay. Uh, although I still had a contractual commitment, it was an eight-year commitment, but mm -hmm. uh, eventually I was honorably discharged uh, at the end of the eight year contractual commitment. Mm -hmm. But uh, at that point in time, I was more involved with private life than I was military reserve duty. Right. Yeah. Right. And it uh, just didn't work out. Do you keep in touch with uh, old comrades and so forth? Very, very uh, limited. I do hear from uh, a, a fellow uh, platoon leader uh, who has served at the same time I did at Fort Ord. We keep in touch. And uh, I know that my old unit at Fort Ord, they have, uh, they have had a, a couple of reunions, but uh, I haven't gotten involved in them. Uh, most of the fellows that I knew very well, very closely, uh, they're gone, so mm -hmm. I haven't had the interest to, to go. Now, as I recall, 
you had the, your, your insignia was something like a, a couple of test tubes or? There was, a, uh, yeah, that was uh, double retorts. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah the, the, the two circular things. I, I, it's hard for me to describe, but uh, that, right. that was the uh, insignia for the chemical core. Still is, of course. Still is, yes. <clears throat> well, that, that was, I, I've always sort of remembered that, and although I was, uh, I was Navy, but I did have um, my <laughs> last year and, and a half, uh, I served uh, mainland side after three years of sea duty. But uh, the, um, so I was in contact, and you talk about San Francisco, and what a great, what a great city that is, it was, and it was then. Unfortunately, I was only there three months. Oh, you did? <laughs> that was temporary duty. Yeah. But it was uh, better than not going there. But I was at the Presidio for three months. Right. TDY before, on my way to, and then from there to Nevada. Sure. Pretty nice duty there in San oh, Francisco. Was, there wasn't any much soldiering going on in <laughs> no. 6th Army headquarters, no. <laughs> it was, uh, it was uh, staff duty. Right. No, right. Not much soldiering. Well, you were, you, you certainly had a wonderful opportunity there to uh, experience that. The, um, did you, uh, so you really never had any um, thought about staying in, staying in the Army? I did, actually. Did you? Yes. Tell us about that. Well, when I was uh, in the desert, at Camp Desert Rock, uh, I was on the staff of Colonel Carl Ludicky. He was a bird colonel, mm -hmm. and he was the 6th Army chemical officer. Mm -hmm. his, permanent, his permanent assignment was Presidio, where 6th Army headquarters was located at that time. And uh, Colonel Ludicky talked to me about whether or not I might have interest in making the Army a career. And I, and I told him uh, honestly that I didn't know at that time that uh, he said, well, think about it. Mm -hmm. And I said, I will. And I did think about it. And then later he said, well, well, Bill, he said, do you, you think you might have any real interest in staying in? And uh, he said, if you, if you are interested in making the Army a career, I think I can get you a regular Army commission. Mm -hmm. But you'd have to transfer to a combat arm, either infantry or armor. And they were crying for, uh, for young officers in armor at that time. He said, you'd probably end up at the armor school in uh, Fort Knox mm -hmm. uh, if you did it. And I, I told him at the time, I said, I, I was still kind of interested, but I can't make up my mind. <laughs> and, and as it turned out, I never did make up my mind. <laughs> so, well, I think that I was, uh, I, had a, I had a compelling urge to go to law school, though. And that, that was a deciding factor. Right. I, I had to do that. I wanted to do that. Yeah. And I had thought about that for a long time, so that's The what law I, had great appeal for you. So that's what I did. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, but it was it was uh, it had appealed to me though. I uh, I thought about it. Right. Um, law school at Virginia <laughs> that that must have been a that must have been a fine experience. You've already alluded to that, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, how many years was that? Well, three years in law three school. Three years. Right. Three years, and you got your. Your uh, juris, jurisprudence, juris whatever. doctor degree, yeah, yeah, right. They call it. Uh, then I came back to uh, Cincinnati and passed the Ohio State bar exam, mm -hmm. and I, uh, I started practicing. Had your family moved back to? By by Ohio? that time, uh, uh, while I was uh, during the fifties, while I was away, uh, my family did. My mother and dad did move back to Cincinnati. Nice. And then they spent the rest of their lives there because mm -hmm. they, they were Cincinnatians born and bred. Oh. And they, except for the 20 years they spent in Pittsburgh, they lived all their life mm -hmm. in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. 
they, they did come back during that period of time, but uh, that's not necessarily why I went to Cincinnati to practice, that's just where the opportunity, mm -hmm. best opportunity was at, for me at that time, so yeah. I did that. And uh, but in 59, I came back to Cincinnati and, and uh, I practiced for 45 years and then I finally Mm -hmm. Retired from practice. Oh, that's I, interesting. So I've been retired from practice now for the last uh, five or so years. Mm -hmm. And uh, after 45 years, I thought, well, that's enough. Hang it up. Let somebody <laughs> else take over now, you know. <laughs> Were you with a law firm here in town? I was initially. I was with Frost and Jacobs for oh, yes. a number of years. And then I left and went with, uh, went into corporate work. I was with Gulf Oil Corporation oh. and then I, uh, then I was in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, my, my, most of my career was in the pharmaceutical industry mm -hmm. uh, with Richardson Merrill and then it became Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. when it was owned by Dow Chemical. Right. And there were a succession of mergers over the years and uh, uh, until uh, uh, 19 or 2004 uh, at the end of 2004 that's that's when I discontinued uh, work in the pharmaceutical industry it was a great challenge and uh, but it was it was exciting mm -hmm. yeah. did you know Bud Merrill absolutely Bud was a, a great friend uh, and he passed away several years ago yes uh, Bud was there the whole time I was there almost although he he retired, uh, he was a little older than I was, and he retired uh, while I was still there mm -hmm. and lived down in Florida. Right. But, but I knew Bud and Jenny quite well. Yes, we yeah. did too. Did yeah. you? Well, you were fortunate. Nice you? people. Yes, absolutely. I should say. Bud was a great guy. And uh, I think he's the last member of the Merrill family who was in business. I think so. And, uh, yeah, they're, they're the end of an era when he retired. Yes, they uh, they had a, a very a very solid impact on the uh, mm -hmm. business community at that time. Well, the uh, you know going back into your military mm -hmm. again, Bill, the um, uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, attitude uh, of a, of military life. Mm -hmm. was uh, quite a change from, from being a civilian. Absolutely. And uh, hopefully for the better. <laughs> I uh, never regretted it. Right. And I felt uh, that it was my part, that I should do my part. I don't know how young people feel today, but uh, I had no regrets at the time. No. And I didn't try to avoid it. Uh, I felt like uh, everyone ought to do what he can do. Well, I think, you know, our, our nation. And I think that's so today, too. But unfortunately, uh, it's a volunteer. We have a volunteer force today, and we have many people who elect not to volunteer. Mm -hmm. But we do have wonderful people who do volunteer. Well, we Thank certainly God. we certainly do, yeah. and uh, <coughs> you know it, it's uh, it's a bit of a controversy whether it is uh, the most effective way to go or not volunteerism, and I know they're you know they're talking about rein, reinstating the the draft uh, and so forth. But the quality, it seems to me, the quality of the military today is, uh, is very high, very high. And, uh, I would agree. And, and you, when you get people who you know, really want to do something like that, mm -hmm. then your, your, your chances of getting the top people are, are pretty good. Um, uh, under your command now, Mm -hmm. As say as a first lieutenant, uh, let's see, you were in charge of a company. Well, initially I was in a uh, smoke generator company at Fort McClellan, and mm -hmm. but I, when I was at Fort Ord, 
I was in a, uh, a, uh, a chemical core unit and uh, we, we were involved in numerous activities uh, that ran the spectrum, uh, radiological safety, decontamination, and uh, smoke. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, by that time, the Army had transferred the 4.2 mortar uh, units to, uh, to, the, uh, to a combat arm. I see. And uh, that was transferred to uh, artillery. Mm -hmm. But during World War II, the 4.2 mortar units were chemical core units. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we had a diversified number of missions in, in that unit. So, and uh, we all had to share uh, numerous duties like uh, motor pool uh, supply. I, I happened to, I was appointed a supply officer, which is a, it's a function that has to be done. Yep. And. Uh, we divided up all the duties among the lieutenants. There were four lieutenants, and we had a captain who was our CO. Hmm. Uh, had a good bunch of men. They were all regular Army men, all the enlisted men. They were all regular Army. Hmm. Uh, none of, well, I don't know if we had any draftees at all. I think they were all RA. Hmm. And, uh, so we had pretty good men. Uh, for the most part, you always have a... Well, you, uh, you certainly... Uh, you certainly uh, Fit in beautifully, I can see that, and um, your uh, spirit and your your leadership <coughs> qualities and everything. The um, uh, in in eventually getting into the law, um, again, you said that you were involved in pharmaceuticals. That's correct. Yeah. And Most of my career, yes. Right, right. What what did that involve? You you were investigating the the uh, importance of what was being manufactured, or <clears throat> well, it it, it uh, surprisingly encompassed a broad range of legal work, which uh, and the, the primary uh, f emphasis was on. Uh, regulatory, government regulatory activity with the Food and Drug Administration, which was uh, uh, an onerous bureaucracy. <laughs> wow. I don't mind using that word. I can imagine. Uh, anyway, uh, that, that took a great deal of time because FDA law and regulations uh, affected everything you did, uh, and uh, from quality control, production, uh, testing, uh, investig investigational testing before drugs got to market, mm. all the way from the time it went out the went out the uh, uh, the shipping dock to go to a depot or right. a, or a distribution uh, point for eventual dissemination to the to the pharmacies that dispensed mm -hmm. it. Every step of the way was governed by bureauc bureaucrats. And uh, there was a lot of onerous regulatory oh, work I, there. I but we also, I got into a lot of other things too, a heavy dose of, uh, of litigation. A lot of litigation, it, it gets involved mm -hmm. with, the, sure. with the drug industry, product liability oh, litigation. <laughs> it, it goes with the territory. The I guess I so. Describe it's, it. it's hard to understand sometimes, you know, you're talking about litigation. Well, unfortunately, we have some people who uh, believe that uh, if something goes wrong, somebody else is to blame for it, and exactly. uh, they're, they're, they should bring a lawsuit and, and receive a windfall. Oh, yeah. Uh, this, is a, this victim mentality has uh, permeated our, our culture now too much so, that's I true. think. That's true. But that's my my personal feeling. Yeah, blame somebody else and then try and make some money off of and, it. Uh, and, and avoid respons personal responsibility for anything that goes wrong or um, try to make somebody else pay for it. But mm -hmm. also there were a lot of other areas too of uh, great involvement, uh, antitrust law, trade regulation, mm. um, government contracts was another big area of, of responsibility. 
copyright and trademark law. There were a lot of areas that we got into. A lot of a lot of contract work. We did a lot of I did a lot of licensing work, uh, product licensing agreements with uh, which you did with companies mm -hmm. uh, f frequently throughout the world. It was a global operation that I was involved in. It wasn't just mm -hmm. U.S. Right. Uh, but many companies are involved in global operations today. Were you, uh, were you sent out into the field, so to speak, and investigating and so forth, or? Well, uh, most, of my, most of my travel uh, from uh, all four corners of the country was involved with product liability litigation. Mm. Uh, otherwise, most of my work was at uh, was at the company headquarters, headquarters, right? But there were other uh, special trips that I made too. But most of my travel was involved with product liability litigation, because it was uh, occurring anywhere from Maine to California and Washington, down to Florida, mm -hmm. and, uh, and many states in between. Right. Did you have any? Uh, no names, of course. But did you have any? Uh, odd experiences that you'd like to uh, tell us about? Oh, I know there were a lot of uh, uh, odd situations or, or strange occurrences that took place. It's hard to think about any in particular at this mm -hmm. point in time, but uh, uh, some were amusing, harmless, and some not so. But, <laughs> <laughs> so things. Uh, in litigation, uh, you never could predict what was going to happen. Right. You know? Did you have to go into court? And uh, I would primarily work with local uh, trial specialists. Oh, I see. Although I did make uh, very limited, rare court appearances, mm -hmm. but mostly uh, our litigation was was handled uh, by local trial specialists. Uh, depending on which state, which jurisdiction we were in, and uh, I had the, I had the good, good fortune to be able to work with uh, a lot of the top litigators in the country mm. that were defense lawyers. Mm, yeah. uh, there was a big demarcation between the plaintiff's bar and the defense bar, as you know. <laughs> but I worked with uh, a lot of the best, so I was fortunate I to, say. to uh, associate with people like that. Well, that, that is, uh, that's uh, interesting to hear, Bill, because uh, mm. uh, you're, you're one of the very, very few that we've interviewed who uh, have had that, that kind of experience. And uh, to come out of the Army with uh, with a good solid military background and everything, I can see where you, your value uh, was inestimable in, in, in the field of law. I think it was, uh, uh, it was a good maturing experience for right. me to be in the Army at a young age. Right. I was 21 when I went on active duty and, and uh, that's a, a, a uh, a period in life when things are not certain and there's a lot of uh, what am I going to do now yeah. attitude and uh, I think that experience was very helpful in growing up a little bit oh, and yeah. uh, oh, my goodness. becoming a little bit more uh, self-assured about what to do and how to do it. Yeah, as, as we look back on those 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 times and those <clears throat> experiences and so forth that uh, uh, is something that uh, absolutely invaluable, of course. And uh, as as you've expressed, you know, it's something that that uh, strengthened you throughout your life. And uh, uh, glad you had the opportunity. You know, people mm -hmm. will say, well, was, uh, you know, how did you feel about being in the military? And, you know, was it difficult and so forth? Well, as we look back on it now, it, it was pretty darn good. 
it wasn't so bad after not all. So I mean, bad. Not not always good, but it no. wasn't as bad as some people might make it to be. Right. I uh, I always uh, had the feeling that uh, uh, that being in the service for what was really a limited period of time, two years of active duty, uh, was not, I didn't consider that a loss of time, no. a waste of time. No. Uh, some people do. Some Fire people look on it as, why do I want to waste two years or whatever in the military when I can be going about my business mm -hmm. and uh, making, making a lot of money and right. getting ahead. I never looked at it that way, and uh, I think most of the people that I was associated with in the service didn't look at it that way either. That's right. But uh, uh, people look at it differently today. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to get involved, and they'd rather go about their private business, which was all right. I don't, I can't criticize that. Yeah. But uh, it's a different attitude. But as you <coughs> earlier, <coughs> as you earlier spoke about it. You felt the obligation to serve mm -hmm. and, and, that, and give back to your country something of, uh, of what you had gained from it. Well, I felt that that was the right thing to do. And, and uh, I, I, I don't know, that there's not necessarily a military tradition in my family, but my father was in World War I. Mm -hmm. He was in France and in Germany after the armistice and the Army of the Occupation. And uh, I had other ancestry way back to the Revolution and the War of 1812 who participated sure. in the military. And uh, so why not me? Why, why, not, why shouldn't I take a turn Absolutely. and step forward? Uh, that's that's, <laughs> that's uh, not the kind of thinking you hear much about today. That's but right. I, I felt like the, that uh, I had to, uh, I had some responsibility to sure. to do what I do something. Speaking of your your lineage, uh, uh, where where did your family come from? To Originally this? from Virginia. Really, from colonial days. Okay. Yeah, my the Harrison line started uh, uh, landed in Virginia, but way back during colonial days, and then uh, eventually. Uh, moved into other areas, mm -hmm. primarily in the South. Uh, most of my heritage is in the South. Mm -hmm. uh, Virginia down through the Carolinas and uh, through Tennessee and into Southwest Kentucky. Oh, yes. And uh, some of it is in Northern Tennessee. Uh, and this all goes back to, to early colonial days. Sure, sure. My mother's family, that was different. They came mostly from Ireland in England mm -hmm. and uh, came down through New England. That great. Uh, yeah. So there was a lot of, a lot of booming as you know. Yeah, in that those great days. era of, uh, of uh, immigration. But it all goes way back. Well, it is, uh, it's, uh, uh, tell us about your, your present family and uh, your, when did you get married? I was married, uh, the year after I finished law school, I was in private practice then. Mm -hmm. My wife's from Northern Ohio, and uh, we have three daughters, all married. We have three granddaughters, and we have a grandson who's almost here. He'll be the first male in the family in three generations. Wow. So, <laughs> so we're excited about I should say. getting a little boy in the family. I should say. Uh, uh, I'm glad that I live long enough to see it, <laughs> to uh, break the chain, so to speak. <laughs> oh, that's, but, uh, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's very exciting, the prospect of, of that is. And, you know, as a grandparent, you know, you don't have to, uh, worry too much about uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the physical hands-on of raising a child again. That's right. <laughs> it's uh, kind of like the best of all worlds. You bet. It? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we, we enjoy them. They're, well, it's fun to watch them grow up and develop. I should say. And see how they, see how they go. Were your daughters educated here in Cincinnati? Uh, one was. 
uh, they all went to different universities. Uh, the oldest one graduated from Auburn University. The, mm. the number two daughter went uh, graduated from Ohio University. The number three daughter went graduated from Mount St. Joseph College. Oh yes, which is now called a university, I think. Mm -hmm. But uh, she was the only one that stayed home Locally. and went went to college. Right. So they all went through college, and uh, we were <coughs> glad, uh, very proud that they all stayed with it and yes. saw it through. Yes. Yeah, that's that's uh, <clears throat> that's a wonderful uh, accomplishment, family accomplishment, and attesting to your your uh, leadership and your support mm -hmm. and your wife. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. Lots of support. Oh boy. Well, my wife had. Uh, probably more to do with that than I did, <laughs> but uh, familial support, but uh, we've, we've been very fortunate. Right, I should say. Was your wife a professional woman before? She was, uh, she was had a BS in nursing. Oh, you know? nursing. She was a nurse. Wonderful. And she worked for uh, a while after we got married, a short while, and uh, primarily she worked in surgery. Mm -hmm. which was a great experience. Uh, tough job, but she, she, uh, she was a good nurse. Mm -hmm. And that, that's been nice to have in the family, too, oh, uh, having I'll a nursing see. skill, yeah. That's been very You very, bet, uh, have somebody beneficial. knowledgeable like that. that yeah. Goodness sakes, yeah, that, that's, uh, that, that's wonderful. Well, the... Uh, the way the world is today, and uh, uh, it is, uh, it's changed so much since in those 60 years that we, you and I have, okay, and, and you and I have uh, gotten out of the service, and uh, some of it is, uh, of course, politics is never, never ending and never endingly interesting. Did you ever aspire to a political office or anything <laughs> like that? Uh, so there were times when I thought, somebody's got to get in there that <laughs> has some common sense. <laughs> get but, this thing straightened but, out. But uh, <laughs> and I, and I had a couple of casual uh, uh, comments from friends or associates. Bill, why don't you uh, run for office? Uh, I, I absolutely said, it would never work. I would say what I think, and uh, you don't succeed in politics if you say what you think. Uh, you you can't you can't play the game if you I know. if you commit yourself. But no, there was never any any serious mm -hmm. thought to running for office at all, really. <laughs> no. Because in bad. your of course in your firm, Frost and Jacobs said it was a big firm and. And uh, you were in the in the Central Trust building downtown. That's right. Yeah, Fourth sure. and Main. Yeah, yeah. For several years, and before I made made my change. Right, mm -hmm. right. And uh, had some great. And of course, you had you had brushes with with important people and uh, so forth, and through your career. At times, yes. Mm hmm. Well, the. Um, uh, what you have done and what you have accomplished, what you have uh, uh, given to our nation, uh, not only as a as a service man and and an officer, but but also as a, a, a solid citizen and uh, one who uh, who saw the need for uh, the practice of law which fit you very, very well. And uh, we thank you so much for your participation. Uh, hope things uh, go well for you, keep going. And uh, are you playing golf? I can't play uh, now since I had my stroke. Oh, I see. But I, I do uh, go out and uh, hit, hit balls one-armed. Mm -hmm. No, but I. Well, that, you do hit. I do that just just to yeah. amuse myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I I I enjoyed a lot of competition when I was yes. playing. I played in a lot of tournaments and uh, events at my club, and uh, 
I miss that a lot because I oh, like man. the I like the uh, I like the the rush of uh, pressure. Yes. And playing golf under pressure. That's yeah. when I played my best golf. Yeah. I think it's a matter of focus. You you focus more when you're playing a serious game than if you're just messing around. Uh, right. Recreating. And, uh, and you know, golf golf is is. Tough. Such a personal <laughs> thing. I mean, you you don't have teammates to support you no, or anything a, like that. You're on your own. <laughs> you're on your own. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> if you if you if you blow a shot, that's uh, look to yourself. Nobody well, else to blame for it. <laughs> that's right. That's Got to make right. For, make up for it. And the way uh, uh, the way the golf is professional golf is exposed today mm -hmm. on television. It's very interesting. It, it, well, it's you know it's really made golf grow oh my tremendously. Goodness, yes. But uh, it, it uh, yeah it, it was probably my main recreational pastime. Yeah. When I could. Sure, sure. Uh, well, we thank you again for for making yourself available to tell your story, and uh, you know from this you get a DVD of the interview. So appreciate that. When you're gone, your family has got that to uh, cherish and look at. As Dennis pointed out, uh, we keep a copy here in the archives of our library and send one to the Library of Congress. So okay. you're on the web and uh, you're, you're out there. You can't hide it anymore, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much. Ted, it was a God pleasure. God bless. And yeah, thank you. Take care. Thank you, sir.